So Sam's announcement said that we get to the heart of things here today in Paul's teaching, and it is the heart of things, the cross and resurrection, Paul's understanding of those events. I'm going to do my best to get at this. Paul treads this ground over and over and over again in his letters, and I will not be able to do justice to his really the profundity of his thinking and his feeling about this, um, but I'll give it my best shot. At the beginning of his first letter to the Corinthians, and this is on, um, this reading is on the second page, uh, third, third uh, piece of print. In the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul is trying to get at the mystery of what the cross is about. And so I'm going to read you a little bit of this. If you come out of it thinking, I don't get it, don't worry, I don't get it either. Uh, but, but this is uh, an attempt for him to uh, plumb the depths of the mystery of the cross. He says, For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, I would prefer to translate that healed. It is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save, heal those who believe, trust. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. So right there, you get Paul's understanding that the cross is a paradox. And that if you're going to try to parse it with human wisdom, you'll never, ever get there. So, let me try to help parse the mystery without removing the paradox. The first thing to assert is that crucifixion was not unique to Jesus. It was a common form of punishment in the Roman Empire. Those um, uprights on which Jesus and the two people next to him were crucified would have been there all the time. He did not carry the upright. He carried the cross piece. The uprights stood as stakes all around the city of Jerusalem, always. And there were often people dying and rotting on those crosses. I know this is horrifying, but this is the only way to get at what Paul's talking about. It was a common, horrifying, terrorizing way of controlling the populace. It was to control slaves and subject peoples. It was to say, the power belongs to Caesar, not to anybody else. We will control you, make no mistake about it. For the chosen one of God, God's Messiah, to die on a cross then is absolute foolishness. It contradicts the idea that God is in control, that God is the powerful one. At least at first, it seems to. He argues in Galatians 3.13 that, that in Christ, God decided that someone should become a curse for us. In other words, instead of us ending up on crosses, or even if we did end up on a cross, God had decided to take the curse of all the horror of the world on himself. Please do not think about this as God taking moral turpitude on God's self. That is too small. If 
Some of you were probably raised to believe that that's what Christ dying for our sins means. That is, I can't say it strongly enough, that is rubbish. That is not what Christ dying for our sins means. Moral turpitude is only one of the problems in the world. Disease, dying early, injustices of all kinds, economic inequality, you name it. The things that make you angry, the things that you say, this isn't right, it shouldn't be this way, that's what Christ died for. To take all of that on himself. Do you see how much bigger that is than moral turpitude? When I drive by an animal that's been killed because we drive too fast, Christ died for that animal. This is a big understanding. I think this is what Paul means. I don't think I'm making this up. Why? Because we are angry at God. We go into life thinking that life should satisfy all our needs, and when it doesn't, we get angry. Do I have a witness? <laughs> I preached about this at the 745 this morning, and I said, if you don't know that you're angry at God, you're not paying attention. <laughs> all the things that go wrong make us angry at God, create a distance between us and God. It's not how God wants it, but that's what happens. This is to read sin as brokenness, the brokenness of creation, the fallenness, if you want to call it, but not moral fallenness alone, but that's part of it. It's all the brokenness. And God decides to do something about it in the most paradoxical of ways, which is to join us in the brokenness. This, I, I, I don't mean this politically. This is not make America strong again. This is the opposite of that. This is, let us become weak together for the redemption of the world. If you don't like that picture, I don't blame you. But I think that this is what Paul is talking about. So let me portray something for you and see if you get it from a slightly less um, shocking perspective. Let's say you've been riding your bicycle and somebody's texting and hits you, but you're not killed. Your ribs are broken, one of your legs is broken, uh, you have a concussion, and you're in the hospital. Who do you want to come and talk to you? And what do you want to be said to you about this brokenness? The brokenness of the person who was callous enough to text and hit you, and your own brokenness. What do you want to hear about that? Do you want somebody to come in and say, we're going to get him. <coughs> we're going to send him to prison. This is going to solve it. Maybe you do. Would it solve it? Or would you like somebody else who's been run over to come and sit next to you and hold your hand and say, I made it through this. You can make it through this. I still limp. But I made it through. And I'm here to help you make it through. And to know that that person also went to the person who's incarcerated to say, I can help you make it through too. Whatever the courts do to you, I can help you make it through. Which would you prefer? 
This is the mystery of the cross. God comes and gets run over. And instead of taking revenge, says, there's a way through. Not around. I'm not going to be able to make it all perfect. But there's a way through. We're going to limp through this together. Why? Why does God do this? Because we need to be reconciled. Not God to us. This is the falsity of a lot of fundamentalist Christian preaching. God does not need to be reconciled to you. God is not angry at you. Disappointed, maybe. <laughs> but you're angry at God, and you're certainly disappointed in God's creation. And you need someone to help you. So do I. So God comes to reconcile us to God. Because we've withdrawn from God because of our brokenness and the brokenness of the world. We're either so sad or so angry or just so broken that we just can't do it by ourselves. And so God comes. And God comes and does something amazing, which is to be with us in a human life that knows every form of brokenness except callousness. Jesus is not callous. He receives callousness. But he is not callous. He gets run over by somebody texting. In fact, the whole world texting. So look at the front page of your handout. I'm afraid that Western Christian theology has badly mistaken the center of uh, what the cross and resurrection are about. But our Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters have never really forgotten what it's about. And here it is in their icon of the resurrection. This is how Christ's resurrection is always portrayed. Jesus is in the middle. Look what he's standing on. Those are the gates of hell. Notice what shape they're in. The shape of a cross. <clears throat> Jesus is standing on as triumphant over all forms of brokenness. But the way he became triumphant over it was to suffer it, to go through it. And then what he comes to do, and this is representational of what he's doing for every person who's willing to grasp his hand, is he's pulling us out of the hell that we're in, the hell of the brokenness of our lives, our anger, our confusion, our desire for revenge, our selfishness, our callousness. He's pulling Adam with his right hand and Eve with his left. And look, there are a lot of other people waiting to be pulled. <laughs> this is resurrection. But notice that the cross and the resurrection aren't separated. It's not that the cross happened and Jesus slept in the tomb, and then the resurrection happened, which is how a lot of Western theology has portrayed this. It's as if it's all one big thing, one big mystery. Jesus was triumphing in dying, because you and I needed somebody to come and sit by our beds when we get run over. And he did that to reconcile us to God so that we wouldn't be so angry or so vengeful or so selfish or so confused that we thought God had turned against us. Because that, I think, is at the center of why we're so angry and confused and vengeful. 
we think we've been abandoned. And unfortunately, an awful lot of theology, especially Western Christian theology, has portrayed it that way. That we deserve to be abandoned. That God is angry at us because we've been such bad boys and girls. But this is the opposite of that. This turns that on its head. And so Paul says a lot about our not being held accountable for keeping law. He does not mean, by the way, when he says that over and over and over and over again, that we have absolute freedom to do whatever we please. What he means is that God isn't keeping a record book in the sky with black marks against you and gold stars to see which one weighs out which I suspect is what a lot of you were taught. God has erased the record-keeping book in Christ, is what Paul concludes. <clears throat> because God wants us to come home. If you want to think about that, think about this morning's parable. God wants us back home. He wants the younger son home, he wants the older son home, he wants us all home. And so he does this to get us home. Now there are these various theories here on the back of your first sheet that are theories of what's called the atonement. Most of them are um, still quite alive in Christian theology. The one that I'm um, holding forth and of the one I think that Paul himself believed in is this one that's called recapitulation. A combination of that and the moral influence theory a little bit further down the page. So let me deal with the ones that I think aren't true first. And that if you've been wounded by, I hope um, this will help. Because I think they're wrong. There's what's called the satisfaction theory. This was uh, promulgated by St. Anselm of Canterbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, in the ten uh, hundreds. His basic, basic idea is that we were disobedient, our disobedience offended God's dignity and honor. God has to be satisfied, God's dignity and honor has to be satisfied, and the only way that could happen is a perfect sacrifice, namely Jesus, who satisfied our offense. I think that this is blasphemous. It was made worse during the Reformation by the penal substitution theory, which adopted Anselm's position and said, you know what, not only did God need to be paid, but, but God then um, took it all out on Christ. So that an awful lot of people I know say, if God has to kill a loved son to redeem the world, I don't want much to do with that God. If you were taught these theories and they still mean something to you, don't let me take them away from you. I happen to think they're blasphemous. If they work for you, they're healing for you. I, you know, Different people are healed in different ways. What I think is healing is the idea that God comes in a human person to recapitulate, this is the one right at the top of the page there, this recapitulation theory, that God comes to recapitulate the whole history of humankind, but to take it in a different direction. That all of the fallenness, all of the brokenness that has happened to human beings, and the whole creation, since things went wrong at the beginning. And don't ask me why it went wrong at the beginning, because I don't know. That's another day, issue, time. Paul's not, I don't think Paul's particularly interested in that. It went wrong. And God comes to do something about it by becoming a human being. 
and to recapitulate everything that we experience for a purpose, which is not to pay a price, but to move us from brokenness to healing and from disobedience to obedience. How does he do this? How does Jesus do this? Well, Peter Abelard advanced in the same century that, that uh, Anselm did. He was actually countering Anselm's theory of satisfaction. What he um, has what often has been called a moral influence theory. Namely this, that God's love is so persuasive in Christ that as we look on him, as we experience him as healer, teacher, feeder, lover, and the one who joins us by getting run over. We are so persuaded that God really does love us that we're no longer angry. And we're no longer frightened. And we're no longer so confused. And we turn back to God out of love. And it changes us. I'm not going to text anymore. Because I don't want to run somebody over. I don't want to argue that I shouldn't pay my fair share of taxes. Because if I don't pay my fair share of taxes, somebody's not going to get an education. <coughs> and so on it goes. Now, this isn't an easy theory. It sounds kind of easy at first, and it, you can dumb it down to make it easy. It's kind of like, oh, I admire God in Christ, and therefore I'm going to change. What that forgets is that changing really is about turning around and changing, and that that's very hard work, that I have to keep my eye on this, this one I love and admire if I'm going to keep changing. Because I'm going to keep screwing up. I'm going to keep re-breaking the creation through what I do and say. I am going to text. God help me. I hope I don't hit anybody. I am going to say, you know what? I don't really want to pay those taxes. I'm going to go to somebody's bedside and say, oh, it'll be all right. Don't worry about it instead of saying, I've been where you are, and we can limp through this together. Because I'm tired of limping and I'm, I'm just going to blow it again. So I have to keep looking back. Which is why we keep coming to church. Because <clears throat> it's really easy to stop looking, and to stop changing, and to get stuck. We all get stuck. The word for that is sin. Not moral turpitude, sin. <laughs> All kinds of brokenness, sin. Moral turpitude is one of the forms of that. A wonderful man in our own time, René Girard, has taken up this moral influence theory and shifted a little bit into a kind of mimetic theory um, and added in uh, psychological material that's deep and important what he says, finally, is we need rituals to solve the problem of the violence that we want to do. Because otherwise, we're going to keep trying to take revenge for the brokenness of creation. And if this doesn't ring bells for you politically, you're not paying attention. <laughs> and I don't mean just um, Donald Trump. I mean all the wars we have fought where we're trying to take revenge on people that we think hurt us. Did it work? Uh, you have to decide whether you think it worked or not. God's solution to the dilemma is to come and die a ritual death, and to turn the horror into a meal. Some of you have heard me say this before, but um, if you knew you were about to be run over by your best friends, would you throw them a dinner party the night before? You know what I'm talking about, right? 
Jesus threw a dinner party for the people that were about to do him in. He takes the horror of brokenness and turns it into a meal. He reconciles them before he ever dies by feeding them. Notice in the parable today, where does it all end up? A feast? A broken son? By the way, I don't admire the father. <laughs> a stupid father. <laughs> and a, a, a kind of a self-righteous son all having a feast together. This is God's solution. It means that you and I stand together at an altar or kneel and receive food, though we were texting this week and almost hit somebody, or maybe did. And though our greed got the better of us. And though we patted somebody on the head and said, oh, there, there, it'll be better, um, instead of sitting down with them and saying, I got one over two. This is the only sacrifice we are asked to do. To let this hit us in such a way that we begin to change day by day, moment by moment. This is God's power. This is how God exercises power. And this is God's wisdom. So God does it to reconcile us, and then to make us what God, uh, you know, what uh, Paul calls ambassadors of reconciliation. This is also in your handout on the Second Corinthians five passage. Top of the uh, page there. So maybe this will help make sense of this passage. What all I've just said. The love of Christ urges us on because we are convinced that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. In other words, you don't have anything to be afraid of. And he died for all so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, this should sound familiar if you've been at the 9 o'clock. This is where the passage started. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. No one. You're now in Christ, which means you're in God. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. If anyone is in Christ, it's a terrible translation. I know why they're doing it, because they don't like the sexism of the he. If anyone is in Christ, it should say, he or she is a new creation. You've been remade. That means you've been remade even if you don't feel like you've been remade. Even if you feel broken still, even if you feel completely angry at God, or distant, or confused, you have still been remade. God has done that for you in Christ. You are new. Verse 18, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself. Notice it doesn't say reconciled himself to us. Reconciled us to himself through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Here's the, the end of the penal substitution theory, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us so we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Don't be angry, don't be distant. Don't think God's out to get you. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Well, what else do you want, friends? <laughs> You've been made perfect in God's eyes. You want an image for this? I still remember this from the first time I ever heard it preached. I was probably eight or nine years old. The preacher said, 
It is as if the person of Christ is imprinted on God's eyeglasses. And when God looks at the world, whatever he sees, he sees through the person of Christ. Sees you as perfect, sees you as remade, sees you as new. Is this Pollyannaism? I don't think so. What it means is that God never gives up. This is not about payment for your sins. This is about persuading you that you are loved. Now, what's the goal of all this? Well, it's to be invited from death into life, to recognize that because Christ has died and we have all died in him, we will never die again. Um, we have very pale baptismal rituals in the West, most of the West, although if you go to Latin America, they've got um, some rituals that you wouldn't like, but you know, it's not so pale. Um, babies are carried in in coffins for baptism in Latin America to indicate that they've already died. Pretty shocking, huh? But it gets the point across. We've already died with Christ, and what baptism is about is about coming through a womb of water into new life. So we will never die. <coughs> Eternal life has already begun, in other words. Eternal life isn't something that starts after you die. Eternal life begins ritually for us as we accept Christ and what Christ has done for us in baptism. It invites us to new life. It invites us to live a different way. Freedom. Freedom from the guilt, the brokenness, and freedom for a reconciled life and to be an ambassador for reconciliation. Now, this is not just for you. It's for everybody. <clears throat> Notice that when you come up to communion, you don't make your communion by yourself. There's always somebody near you. Because that person's been healed also, redeemed also. That is your brother or sister in Christ. This is what the body of Christ means. That together, we know that we've all been run over. And we all know that somebody sat down next to our bed to say, we're going to make it through together. There they are, all around you. If you project onto people around you that they're more broken than you are, or you project onto them that they've got their life all together, that's just a projection. We are all equally broken, and we all have our life equally not together and together. Paul's image for what this is supposed to do is, is it's supposed to help us to see that the life that we were living before we came to believe and trust was like a seed that drops into the ground. This is in 1 Corinthians 15. That our corrupted and corruptible bodies, of which he doesn't mean um, sex or gluttony. He means the whole fallenness of us has been planted to be resurrected. We have a new body. It's all around you. One of the things I find the most moving at communion is to go from feeding a mother and father and their young child to someone who's in her 80s. or 90s. There it is, the whole body of Christ being redeemed together. In other words, resurrection is not just for the life to come. It is for this life. When we hand you the bread and say, the body of Christ 
the bread of heaven, we're not talking about then and there. We're talking about here and now. This banquet, this heavenly banquet that we're celebrating together. Because you stand next to somebody that you may not particularly like or understand. Who figuratively may have run you over this week. Who may be selfish enough to be texting and not paying attention to you. And guess what? You've been treating them the same way. <clears throat> and there we are all being fed with bread of heaven. Heaven has come among us. We are merciful enough to each other to be together. That may not seem like a very high bar, <laughs> but it's a pretty high bar. My wager is that if you turned around and looked at this room, most of these people are not people you would have chosen as your friends. Not because they're awful, they're terribly ickier than you, <laughs> but because you would never have known them. You would never have known that they got run over by a truck. But here you might find it out. And you might find out, oh my gosh, I could figuratively put my head on your shoulder at the altar rail. I'm not alone in this. Now, if you think this is easy, you're not paying attention. <coughs> you know that thing that I talked about last week, 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, those chapters about what it's like to live in the body together? You know, about being patient and kind and not boastful and all of that? Loving and having faith and hope? That stuff isn't easy. There's at least one member of this congregation who hates me. There are probably more. <laughs> but here we are together. Which is to say that the forgiveness that God exercised in Christ is essential. And that it's a process. If you can't forgive the person who just ran you over, neither could I. That's why somebody needs to sit next to you and say, we're going to limp through this together. It may take years, decades. Mm -hmm. We do it at Eucharist. We do it in small group Bible studies. We do it in coffee hour by talking to each other. We do it by hearing each other's stories by not being so afraid of each other, that we actually listen to each other. This life in Christ here <coughs> is a foretaste of resurrection. If you've gotten hung up on the resurrection being about a dead body standing up, you've missed the point. Because a dead body has already stood up. It's all around you. <clears throat> the fact that you're here means your dead body has stood up because you've been run over countless times, and so have I. But we still have faith and hope and love, however imperfectly. So resurrection's real. Practicing that here and now means that you won't be surprised at the gate of heaven. Because remember, there's no, there's no book there with black marks and gold stars. What there is is an invitation to a banquet. And you will have been practicing the banquet here. And you won't be surprised that that's what you got invited to. And that Donald Trump got invited to. <laughs> <laughs> or whoever you think shouldn't be elected. <laughs> Hillary and Donald will both be there. <laughs> um, if you're not ready to welcome them at the banquet, that's why we keep coming to church. <laughs> I'm not ready to welcome at least one of them. <laughs> yes, either. So as you go into Holy Week, I hope what you will do is let 
these ritual moments. Palm Sunday, Jesus is going to get run over after the triumphal entry. Monday, Thursday, where he gets down and washes the feet of people that are about to do him in. Good Friday, when he takes all that brokenness and says, guess what, you're not alone in it. And then the mystery of Easter, where the community gets put together out of broken pieces. And life goes on. Remember all this. Paul tries to summarize it in sometimes mysterious words, but I think that's what he's talking about. And by the way, if you don't understand Paul, that doesn't matter. What matters is, can you try to live this? Can you let it hit you and let it help you live it? Um, remember, when I stand up here in front of you, I don't stand here as someone who has it all together. I need you to sit by my bedside and remind me that we're getting through this limping together and that Christ is in you just as Christ is in me and that resurrection is guaranteed.